Moments ago, Clarissa and her team spoke to us from inside the Syrian capital of Damascus. Here is some of what she told us. It's a little bit eerie, certainly, and there's definitely a sense when you talk to people that they're delighted, but they're cautious, they're concerned. What comes next? Will there be chaos? Will there be lawlessness? Will we see more looting uh, like we saw today? But if you have that other clip pulled up, I just would love our viewers to be able to see uh, the scene at that border crossing as we pass through it. Again, it was already dark, already past curfew, very, very quiet, and just nothing like we've seen it before. The only real evidence we saw, Wolf, of any struggle to finally take uh, Damascus, to finally ouster Bashar al-Assad, was a tank in the road below a torn poster of President, or I should say former President, Bashar al-Assad. Take a look at that clip if you can. So we are just crossing now into Syria. It's astonishing to see. It's absolutely empty border points before there would have been soldiers, there would have been border guards. Now there is absolutely nobody from the Syrian regime. <laughs> friendly people waving us through. And honestly, the last time I came down this road was back in 2011. I was leaving Syria. I had been undercover in Damascus, posing as a tourist. Went back into Lebanon. And I never would have imagined this moment would come when we would be driving And Wolf, uh, my cameraman, Scott McWinney, just found this on the ground, literally, as we were listening to that clip. This is the old flag of the Syrian regime, which has two green stars. The rebels flag has three green stars, but this one has now been literally, we just found it on the floor. Uh, I guess a real moment where you see how much things have changed just in the past 24 hours. In terms of the security situation on the streets, I would just add, we anticipated that we might see quite a lot of checkpoints as we came into the city. We didn't. We did see a group of men. Um, they did not appear to be armed, but they asked us what we were doing, where we were going. And now that we are sort of ensconced uh, in our place where we're staying for the night. We have seen a couple of patrols. I saw two men armed and I went up to them and asked them where they were from. They told me they were from Idlib, which is in the northern part of the country. And we saw a man on the street go up and wanted to pose for a photograph of them, which I think sort of speaks to the moment. There is obviously jubilation, elation, but also this sense of you can't compute. It was so fast, so breathtaking. It's astonishing. And I think people are taking some time to try to process the magnitude. Keep in mind, Wolf, we're talking about 53 years of Assad rule, 53 years of a brutal police state. And I can't tell you how many Syrians have said to me, Wolf, that, you know, we understand that there are concerns about the rebels and the makeup of the rebels and the fact that some of them are Islamists and some of them are even jihadists or have been affiliated with Al Qaeda or prescribed organizations. But let us have this moment. Let us celebrate the fact that this brutal dictator who has ruthlessly killed hundreds of thousands of people, who has gassed children with lethal nerve agents, who has locked people in prisons and tortured and beaten them to death, that he is finally gone. And that whatever may come, and whatever the anxiety, this is a new chapter for Syria, Wolf. Uh, Clarissa Ward now uh, having made her way to Damascus, the Syrian capital. Clarissa, thank you very much. I want to bring in CNN's international diplomatic editor, Nick Robertson, right now. He's done a lot of reporting from Syria and the Middle East over the years. Nick, what do we know, first of all, about this transition of power in Syria right now?
Yeah, risk and opportunity is sort of the way that uh, President Biden spoke about it in his speech there. He mentioned being vigilant, and he said that because we've heard, he said, what the rebel leadership, who had its roots in al-Qaeda, we've heard what they're saying. It sounds like it's good. They're talking about a non-sectarian society with a new political dispensation. Um, and uh, this is something that, that President Biden said they need to live up to. We've heard the words, but we need to see more. And, and, and what President Biden laid out that he expects is in the future is a Syria that's sovereign and independent, which seems to be a very clear message, crystal clear. Russia and Iran will no longer have any kind of stake in the future of Syria. So that's part of the political picture going forward. It's made up of the different uh, ethnic groups. It's made up of the different religious groups. It's made up of all the different uh, elements of society inside of Syria. That's President Biden's aspiration. And that's very much what we've been hearing from the rebels. And I've been talking to actually a, a, a political grouping way outside of the, the rebel structure who were central to peace talks uh, back with Assad's regime. And about a decade ago, the United States was playing a role in that. And there was a lot of work laid out back then for what a new government could look like, what a new constitution could look like, who could be involved in it. And this, this political leader told me that's the direction he believes that the country is headed in again, a period of military uh, security, the military pull back. There's a power sharing government for a period of time, six to nine months, perhaps he outlined, and then elections. Um, and this really fits in with what you know President Biden was saying, that this new Syria will have a new constitution. Some of that's been drafted in the past and a new government, the plans to get that new government and achieve it have been made there. But, but President Biden being very clear that ISIS will not be allowed to fill a vacuum. U.S. strikes on ISIS today, the security of U.S. forces vitally important, but also making sure that ISIS doesn't get stronger and remembering that there are hundreds and thousands of ISIS families and supporters in jails inside of Syria today in the, in the rebel-held areas in the east that the United States supports and helps and helps keep them controlled, um, that will be vital to oversee going forward. And that is going to be of strategic importance to the United States. So that, that's the path that he's setting out. The rebels are setting out a path of, of change, no longer brutality, political, um, uh, religious plura plurality. Nick, uh, I want you and our viewers to listen to what the rebel leader who led this revolt against Bashar al-Assad's regime said just a short time ago. Listen to this. This victory, my brothers, is a victory for the entire Islamic nation. This new triumph, my brothers, marks a new chapter in the history of the region, a history fraught with dangers, leaving Syria as a playground for Iranian ambitions, spreading sectarianism, stirring corruption. It became the world's leading source of captagon. But today, Syria is being purified by the grace of God Almighty and through the efforts of the Arog Mujahideen. So, Nick, uh, does that speech give us some insight on what could happen next now that these rebel groups are in control? Yes, it does. Um, it, you would expect, and this is what we've heard here, in any speech, he's essentially going to thank his supporters, which is the Islamist fighters who've been part of this coalition of rebel groups. And that's what he said. This is, you know, he, and let's not forget the context of where he was. This is in the, this mosque, the Umayyad mosque is in the, is in the heart of Damascus. It's an ancient and, and, and frankly, very beautiful building in, in old stone. And it is sort of, if you will, the, uh, the, the one place you would expect him to go and give a speech for an Islamist leader in the most venerated mosque in, in, in Syria. Um, in that context, he speaks to the people who got him to power and got him to Damascus. But he also speaks about no longer for Iran to have an interest. I think that very clearly sort of talks and speaks to uh, the negative interference that he sees Iran has played in Syria, but also to its Shia faith. He's a Sunni. There's a difference. But when he speaks about Captagon, that's a message to leaders in the region. Captagon, the drug, has been an absolutely pernicious and deadly impact uh, on the 
countries in the region from Jordan to Saudi Arabia. They all want to see an end to that production. It's damaging their societies. The money of it's kept Assad in power. And when he says that, what Jelani is doing is speaking to the leaders in the region who will help continue to keep him in power. So he's talked to the people that have brought him to a place of power and he's talking regionally to those who he hopes can help keep him in power, Wolf. And this new group, this, uh, this group, uh, HTS, not necessarily a new group, but clearly a very powerful group right now, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, uh, is in charge. They've taken over for Bashar al-Assad's regime. Nick Robertson reporting for us. Thank you very, very much.